Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this e. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Eames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Jason Madden with the Outlier Fitness Project and the Entrepreneur Source. And we're going to rock it on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. I love it, man. Listen, seriously, I want you to, <laughs> I just made you to your intro three times. So uh, that's my bad for being a bad host. But I want you to tell me about, and I wanted to spend more time on this, the incredible work you guys are doing with the Tony Robbins folks. So give me an idea of what the heck is going on. And we're going to put this up in advance of this event. So veterans, pay attention. Family members of veterans, pay attention because this is a fantastic which, I cannot say it enough. This is a fantastic opportunity. So, Jason, give us, what are you guys working on for Veterans Day weekend with Tony Robbins? So, yeah, hey, um, so we're partnered up with the uh, Veteran Empowerment Trust nonprofit, uh, the Tony Robbins Foundation, and a badass Marine uh, named Matthew Sanchez, who's taken on Herculean task of raising funds and getting tickets for 22 combat veterans to go to uh, Tony Robbins unleashed a power event uh, over the Veterans Day weekend in Newark. We actually have four more people that we can bring along with us. Wow! Uh, so slots are open right now, and we're looking for people to bring out there. Uh, but what we're going to do out there, we're going to be interacting with the Tony Robbins crowd. Uh, the 22, of course, is a number to bring awareness towards veteran suicide. Yeah. Uh, we we're losing 22 a day. It's almost one an hour. It's unbelievable. So we are going to take some massive action to bring awareness to this crap, man. And we're going to go out there. We're not going to leave leave it at that. Uh, with the veterans that we're going to be bringing out there, uh, we're going to be doing a coaching program, like a long-term coaching program uh, where we're going to be working on career stuff. We're going to be working on maybe they want to become business owners and entrepreneurs. Maybe they have some other things that they need to work on. We're certified in neurolinguistic programming and heart math and can provide some limited uh, counseling type services. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to be working with them for at least 18 months uh, is the commitment that we're giving to these folks. And we're going to be doing this every year from here on out. Yeah, this is a, a big thing because... As a guy that struggled to transition and seriously have had a lot of suicidal ideation myself, I, I get it. You know, one more bad break may have been too much for me, you know, and I never really got truly that close, but I would never want to get that close again, you know, so it was it was not a good thing. And we do lose a lot of people and it's very tough. So I'm a guy with a lot of skills like you, counterintelligence, you know, I, I should be useful. I go to Google to put my MOS in and what I get told, I, I, I get told that I could be a, a warehouse guy, you know, or, or things that have nothing to do with who I am and what I've done. And, and, you know, you know, our level of work. I was a master at working within the organization so that the commander really saw value in what I did. And I'm not just saying, oh, he read my reports. I mean, like I had open couch access, not waiting in line because they wanted to know what I thought about what was going on. And then you go out and nobody even wants to interview me, you know? Right. Like, God damn. That, it, so your, your relationships always suffer. Financially, you start running out of money because you're burning through your savings. And then you have no professional well-being. What's left? Yeah. So I had I literally had to turn myself into a handyman, and that's how I survived. And and I had a lot of friends help me along the way. My you know my buddy Jeff, my buddy of course John from the show we handyman together. My buddy Dave, we worked through hard times together. But it was just survival mode. And having something access to something like this where I could just say I need help. You know, everybody's like, well, fix your resume. Like, motherfucker, I've fixed my resume a hundred times. I had professionals do it. What I didn't have was anybody opening a door for me or showing me how to run my own business or whatever. So I literally just mashed my face into a wall until finally, you know, I worked hard enough that enough things broke through. So 
It's this is such an enormous thing, and and I think a lot of veterans are wired to be entrepreneurs, and especially especially guys like us, because y- you no. know how this goes doctrinally in the military, especially in the army. You know, everybody's like, okay, you're you used to be an eleven Bravo, you used to be an infantryman. You know your job. You know where you stand. You know what you're supposed to do. And maybe it's weird, but there's not a lot of questions. When you're a counterintelligence agent, they're like, uh, go do what you do, Raj. Raj. And you figure it out. Yeah. And you make your own plan. <laughs> like, well, I do like drinking cocoa, and I like talking to mayors, so let me go do that and see how that goes. But you literally, like, they don't know. Like, nobody, like, when we do an exercise, and you've been to these exercises, they're like, okay, whatever you guys do doesn't count in the exercise because you're going to go chase bad guys and that kind of thing. Like, yeah, we get it. We're weird. So we, <laughs> we go out, wear civilian <laughs> clothes. We don't shave, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, we, we do a bunch of role playing. It's, it's pretty fucking hilarious. So, but anyhow, guys like that, it's hard to get them to fit within a system because I, I, I know what it takes to go find the most evil people and then convince them to betray their buddies, their family, their country, whoever it is. Right. That's, if that's not fucking marketable to you, Mr. CEO, Madam CEO, then what the hell's wrong with you? Come on. Cross language, cross religion, cross culture, uh, you know, dangerous, non permissive environments. I'm able to get people to move towards the goal of, of betraying their people. Uh, I would think that you'd ha- you'd have some kind of job for that person. So, okay, let's go back into the entrepreneur thing. Why entrepreneurship? How did you how did you latch onto that? That's an interesting story. So, I was um, kind of in the same boat as you. Um, I actually got out earlier this year, uh, so my my transition was about six months before that. So, so back in 2017, um, mid mid to late 2017. I'm putting in my resumes. I'm trying to get jobs. I'm networking. I was in Colorado Springs. I was the uh, the 4ID G2X at the time. So I'm I'm looking at you know Lockheed and all the little cool agencies that are out and around the Colorado Springs area. And I just kind of realized that you know, why why do I have to do counterintelligence? Why do I have to continue doing this job? Um, I've been you know, within the military structure, military organization, since I was 17 years old, it's maybe it's time to go see what else is out there. Right. Um, what do I really enjoy doing? What do I want to do? Um, so <laughs> I actually always wanted to own a gym. You know, me and my buddy back in Montana, we always talked about putting together a gym and, you know, like cafe in it or something, maybe attach it to a brewery or, or whatever. Right. You know, so we're kind of looking at, I was looking at anytime fitness concepts and stuff like that. And I was like, whoa, franchising, that, that's pretty cool. You know, it's a business in the box. You know, it's, uh, it has standard operating procedures, rules and regulations, you know, things that I can kind of grow. It's already there. I could just use that critical thinking skills that I got from the military and just kind of blast it out of nowhere, you know, just kind of use that system uh, to my advantage. Uh, so... I started talking to actually an entrepreneur source coach um, who specializes in, you know, franchise coaching and entrepreneurship coaching and stuff like that. And, you know, I liked what she did so much that I wanted to do her job mm. and because I saw value in that and how I can help transitioning veterans. Um, this is, this is an option C franchise businesses. That's an option C for, for anybody getting out of the military is what do they, what do they tell you? You know, when the SBA does come by to teach you about, you know, startup businesses and stuff like that, they basically tell you how hard it is to get an SBA loan. Right. That's, that's about it. They don't tell you about all these other funding options that are out there to veterans, um, uh, business lines of credit, uh, other SBA types of loans that are for people specifically going into franchises that are pretty simple to get into. And oftentimes people think that they can only go into one industry. It's like, oh, I think Chick-fil-A is, you know, that's a great culture. That's a great company. Well, it's not really a franchise because you can't build equity into that business and sell it mm, when you're done. Right. When you're done, you're done. You give it back to the company. So, so I do some of those cr- educational and coaching types of, you know, sessions with my clients 
And then we kind of do what we call the ILWI, the Income, Lifestyle, Wealth, and Equity Goals. Uh, we find you know, what they really want to accomplish and use the business as a vehicle towards the goals, whether it's uh, an income goal, you know, maybe it's a passive income and you're doing a semi absentee ownership business, or maybe it's, um, maybe you want to be flexible. Maybe you want to have something like that's mine. That's like mine. You know, it's virtual and mobile. Like I'm going to Hawaii next week uh -huh. uh, with my wife and I'm still going to be able to work. I was just in Montana three weeks ago or last week, actually for three weeks, you know, hunting and, and doing my thing and still being able to carry on with my businesses. So, so I do those types of, so I help people kind of learn about what's out there. And then we do, then I throw resources at them to actually get into those businesses and, you know, enrich their lives. Man, that's like, I, I wanted to stop and then just start having you help me, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> look, the podcast thing is awesome and my life is so enriched by it, but you know, yeah, I might always need a little extra money and, and I certainly don't make enough, you know, like I, I live really lean, you know, I, I, you're just you're talking right to me this is exactly the the kind of thing that i want heck my uh my girl and i she's talking about doing a franchise herself and it's like yeah, how do you navigate all that i didn't know you know all these different resources it's so it's so cool to hear about that so let me okay let me back up let's talk about tony robbins real quick so you you have 22 veterans going to a tony robbins event how many times a year do you guys do this from what i understand upw goes I think it's twice a year. Um, this is going to be our first first time doing this. Okay. Um, Matt is saying that he wants to do it again in March. Wow. So he, he wants to turn and burn on this one and keep doing every single UPW. Um, That's going to be pretty freaking amazing, and it's going to be a Herculean effort. How, so, do, you, how do you guys raise, uh, raise funds for that? GoFundMe. We have the nonprofit uh, that we're filtering funds through with the, um, um, the Veteran Empowerment Trust. And we're just getting out there. We're just kind of marketing ourselves and we're just kind of beating our drum as loud as we possibly can. And we're doing, you know, doing things like this, doing the, doing the podcasts. Uh, we're all over Facebook. We're all over Instagram. Uh, we're, we're just really getting ourselves out there as much as possible. Uh, between my two businesses, the Outlier Fitness Project and the Entrepreneur Source, I'm using those as vehicles to get the, uh, get the word out as well. And, what does it cost? I mean, 22 people, you're putting them up, you're feeding them. They're going to this. I mean, that's a lot of money. Like what, what is, yeah. what do you have to raise it's for It's about 5,000 per person because the tickets wow. are not cheap. Yeah. You know, the tickets are about uh, close to three grand per person to go to these events. Uh, okay. So tickets aren't cheap for this, but the, the Tony Robbins foundation is helping you guys out though. Yes. And, and we've, we've got some sizable donations. Like people will just give us tickets uh, nice. that are that go to these uh, these events so when we go to these events we get the word out like Matt went to his first event back in June I think and he committed to to making this thing happen and he reached out to people that were at the event and he actually got several tickets donated to him through through people that were participating in the UPW yeah just to kind of clarify what UPW is uh, the Unleash the Power Within is it's not some type of hokey guru thing where, you know, we're just going to pump you up and motivate you. It's actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it's actually, they actually practiced viable skills for um, being able to cope with uh, trauma, uh, being able to enrich your, your marriage and your, your relationships. There, there's even skills for people that are in business, um, mastering influence, you know, sharpening your sales skills. So, so they have a, they have a large inventory of things that you can focus on and you can learn from from these events. Okay, so and then Tony also has his like his upgraded, you know, I don't want to call it his buddy program, but the program where you get more of his attention. Is he also contributing in that way as well? Uh, was it the uh, the platinum? Yeah, Lion yeah, those kind of things. Group? Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah, some of those folks are the ones that are donors. Okay. Okay. Sure. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Tell me what Tony Robbins is going to do. Like once you guys are there is how is he going to recognize you guys? I think he's going to bring us up on stage, to be honest. Um, uh, bring us up on stage. And I mean, when I went to business mastery back in August, he would actually donated a million dollars to veteran causes. Wow. So this is something that's near and dear to his heart. So he's going to uh, really use us as a way to, 
help get the word out about veteran suicide. Right, 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 right. So you must have some kind of tale about someone you know that, that took their life. Like I, I know a CI brother that, that just couldn't bear it anymore, and he took his life. When those moments happen, what do you think? Like, what's the, uh, and I don't know how close you got into that kind of thing. Sounds like you're still, like, working on getting out and moving on. So maybe you haven't haven't had those uh, lower despair moments. But what is it? about veterans and suicide why why are we so driven to do that and 22 is the number that we use but let's be honest there's a lot of of self-hate and self-abuse that goes on that leads to death and that number well exceeds 22 absolutely and i think it's i think overall it's it's loss of community Mm. you lose your community when you get out of the military and and some guys just they don't know how to hold on to that they don't know how to they don't want to transition from that, but they also don't want to be in the military anymore. Right. You know, so right. as, as a whole, the veteran community, we need to, we need to do a little bit better job of reaching out to our brothers and sisters out there and, and helping each other out. I know when you, when you first get out of the military, uh, you're, you're very much, um, for yourself, uh, cause it's a survival mode. Yeah. Uh, and then you kind of, you separate yourself from each other. I've seen it uh, doing some veteran networking and stuff when I first got out. It wasn't very pleasant, it, to be honest. It wasn't it was, no? you know, guys are looking at you like, you know what, I, I got to get a leg above this guy. Yeah. You know, and it was this competition thing. So we're not doing a great job of holding each other up yeah. in some cases. You know, so, when, I want to speak to folks, too, that are like, yeah, we have a job fair. If you want me to jump off a bridge, encourage me to go to a job fair because you're going to have a bunch of defense contractors. And like you, I didn't want to work in the threat world anymore. I didn't want there to be threat lurking and worried of who's taking my picture. I just didn't want to do that. you know. And I think no. I get to say that, and then I get to take some really incredible skills and transfer them. So when I show up at your, your job fair and I say, I've got this many years of counterintelligence work, I have an advanced degree I've deployed to combat zones, been left on my own. I can work unsupervised. And if you come back with, we have an entry level job that starts at twenty eight thousand dollars a year. Like, you eat my resume, dude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I have a five page resume uh, because I've done five pages worth of stuff. You want only two on there? You know, great. But. Yeah. This resume doesn't equal twenty eight grand or thirty five grand. Frankly, fifty four grand. So, when you have a job fair, coach your folks that if veterans come up, spend a minute understanding how long they've been and what they've done, and and don't look at them like an MOS for crying out loud. Uh, MOS is a job code. So my job code, Jason's job code. When I was in, it was ninety seven Bravo. It, it changes every now and then, but it's still it's a counterintelligence agent. It means that I'm qualified to do. I'm qualified to carry a badge of credential. I'm a federal agent. So when you come at me with a basic job, it means you you either don't haven't taken the time to understand who I am and what I've done and why have I given you a resume in the first place, or you don't care. I don't believe that you don't care. So it's just you haven't taken the time to understand. I've designed training, I've executed training, I've facilitated training, I've, you know, on and on and on, all of these things that we've we've done. And whatever I've done, I'm sure you've done a hundred other things that are in our field because it's so multidisciplined that allow allow you to go be left alone in a non-provisive environment to do, just figure out what it is that you're going to do. Yeah, like the dozens of times i've been to africa by myself yeah yeah <laughs> you know yeah um and, and you know you're, you're qualified to investigate national security crimes like come on man <laughs> yeah yeah can i maybe talk about a management program with you guys no oh it's because i have a, a management degree that would have been great if you would have said yes to that you know so all right let, let's i, I want to stop uh working so hard and let's have a little bit of fun you have deployed you've been to iraq several times <laughs> holy shit so by the way by the way jason as a spy can go into <laughs> and still be alive 10 years later pretty fucking incredible man uh t- let's talk about that let's talk about what you've done in Mali and all these other places obviously we'll avoid the uh the classified stuff but when you when you get the orders you're going to be working 
everybody always asks me, but you're not an Arab. You don't, do you speak Arabic? I'm assuming you don't. No. Okay. No, so don't. what do you do? <laughs> Literally, what do you do? <laughs> well, we were told that we were only going to be in there for a week. And we had actually packed, originally had packed rucksacks and, you know, assault packs for, you know, you know, for, for a really long mission. Um, we had a commander tell us, no, bring assault packs only. It's only going to be uh, a couple of weeks. We're going to do a quick push. Uh, this was during the surge time. So we're going to do a quick push through there. Uh, we're going to, we're going to clean out a couple of, uh, neighborhoods. We're going to clear some cities just like we did in, uh, in Fallujah back in 04, uh, when I was in the Marines, you know, we're, we're going to clear out a couple of cities, you know, that's a dangerous job, you know, uh, door to door doing some CQB kind of stuff. Uh, so we packed up just our assault packs and they brought us to this hell hole called JSS Ur. <laughs> Didn't even like get a full name. Are. Yeah. Beautiful <laughs> name. Nothing but Hesco barriers and T walls. That's all this place was. This is, this is bags of dirt and cement just for the, uh, for yeah. the listener. A T wall can be <laughs> six feet high, 10 feet, 20 feet. It just kind of depends, but yeah, so big T walls. So those cement walls you see on TV that are, that are movable and then literally a basket with a bag inside full of rocks and dirt. That's what he lived in. Okay, keep and of going. Of course, this is the, during the time of the invention of the JDAM, oh, which boy. is a improvised rocket uh, that they shoot out <laughs> of pickup trucks, basically. So, so we got to, you know, we got our, ourselves, you know, you know, a nice little hailstorm every now and then. Um, but. Yeah, we ended up staying there for over a month with um, the clothes on our backs and a couple of uh, sets of underwear, and that's about it. And it was pretty, uh, pretty great time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Doing, it's, uh, it's hard living. Eight-hour patrols every day, and yeah. When you were in Fallujah, were you uh, infantry with the Marines? I was. Yes, I was a 0351, which is a anti-tank assault man. Okay. Uh, basically, we had the javelins. Uh, Back then, it was the small, which is like a small D. It's a, it's a 81 millimeter rocket with a nine millimeter spotting scope. Right. Um, so, so we we had the those soft skin Humvees, and we uh, we did Operation Phantom Fury back in 04, and we cleared cleared Fallujah. Yeah. You cleared Fallujah in 04, but let's let's talk about what that means. This is the time frame when they hung those contractors, Americans, off of yeah. the bridge. They burned them and hung them. Basically, General Mattis said, there's about to be a reaping. Anybody that don't want to get killed better get the fuck out of town. And a lot of people stayed. Yeah, and a lot. <laughs> a lot. And we killed so many people, there had to be a tactical pause. Like, there's so many dead people out here. We've, we've got to pick them up and get them out of the way so we can get back to killing people. It, and uh, it, it, it was a rough, rough time. Now, okay, so uh, I always like to ask this kind of joke. As a tank killer for the Marines, how many tanks did you kill? Zero. Oh, <laughs> What? No, a whole lot of buildings, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure they let you use those things. Yeah, shoot it right through a building. Yeah, we actually got to implement a a javelin in action. Not a whole lot of people can say that. <laughs> that is actually pretty damn cool. Okay, uh, and the infantry stuff is awesome. But the 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 job that interests me more, the spy versus spy stuff, is is yeah. the counterintelligence thing. What's what's your deal? How do you how do you go out? And and so counterintelligence uh, audience is very complex there's there's the spy hunters there's tactical there's strategic there's a thing called stractical where you kind of you might have a suit on one day and a uniform on the next but there's also lie detector people bug sweepers like just a wide variety of jobs looking we we also do a lot of screening so all of that vetting you hear about in the news it's guys like us that do that do you have magic powers when you talk to someone to know if they're lying or not after a couple of questions? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so talk about some of the weird stuff that's happened, though. I mean, you've been to Africa. You've been to Iraq. You, you've you seen things where you're just like, I, I, I can't believe that I'm doing this or this just happened. Give us some of that stuff. So, yeah, I had a really interesting – I guess we could all say all the counterintelligence folks, that their, their time during their, – while being in that job was very interesting. Um, I started out – Pretty late, um, as, as far as my career goes, I was a staff sergeant when I transitioned over uh, to counterintelligence. 
And I went straight to U.S. Army Africa, uh, which was out of Italy, based out of Italy. Um, so, so my first um, time putting on my my CI hat was basically practical, as you okay. said. Now we're we're at a command headquarters, but nobody, aside from the 66 MI, no one was really in Africa. Right. So, so we had to really establish as a headquarters element. We really had to establish our our intel infrastructure out there. So I did a, I did a lot of interesting stuff and went out to uh, Nigeria at the Defense Intelligence College, you know, did some training on Domex and, you know, basic tradecraft stuff with those folks during the Coney time. Tell them what you Domex know, is. Document and media exploitation. So, so basically, uh, say you're at a border. And you have somebody crossing over and they have documents. They have their, their passport or, or whatever they have for traveling in Africa. It's not always a passport, uh, some type of travel document or some type of strange, crazy ID. So we taught them how to scan those and put those into the databases. We also had equipped them with uh, uh, Seek systems, which uh, is a system that basically scans your biometrics uh, through your, your iris in your eyes, your fingerprints, and even facial recognition. And so we, we taught them how to store all that information and be able to use it and balance it against national databases, which we had given them some a certain amount of access to in order to be able to protect their borders. Uh, so we taught them a lot of that kind of stuff, taught them a little bit about some, some interrogation stuff, and some MCC, which is Military Counterintelligence Collections. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Day Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Interrogation stuff and some MCC, which is Military Counterintelligence Collections. And it was, uh, it was a great time. I spent uh, six weeks out there, uh, went out there intermittently through my whole three years uh, to check on them when I was out in uh, USARAF checking on them and making sure that they're doing continuing education and stuff like that. I was at the Taji Military Intelligence Academy teaching advanced, I'm doing Cody Fingers, advanced source operations for Iraqi officers. And <laughs> I spent about, because this is complex stuff, and I want to get back into this part for us, but let's just talk about the Iraqis for a second. We spent about three weeks where I was talking about controlling a conversation, you know, so not necessarily interrogation, but definitely akin to it. But how do you get someone to start talking? That was the main thing. And yep. at the conclusion of this very well-crafted professionally, not by me, but professionally written curriculum that I delivered as a guy with a lot of years in the field doing this stuff, one of the guys said, but Mr. Beat, because that's what they call me, Mr. Beat, uh, but we will just, we will shock their balls. And I'm like, uh, well, you know, um, <laughs> that is a technique. Uh, yeah, okay, not Rambo. one that I do. But I mean, like, seriously, it's hilarious because we try to bring these things to them. And I guess I'll tell another story, too. So same kind of thing where we're trying to give the Iraqis all of these capabilities. And then, you know, because I, I always focus on building trust, Jason. That, that's my thing, right? Yep. And so because they trust me, they'll say, you know that. This isn't real, right? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I really did not know. They're like, all of this capability you're giving us, this is for you guys. This is not for us. Like, we don't have the internet. We don't reliably have electricity. No one's really going to check these things. No one's going to go to jail for this. And so I went, huh, you know, actually, that actually makes a lot of sense. And so I started sort of tracking the rest of my time in Iraq, like whenever anybody got arrested, if there was a prosecution and if they used the national database. And it basically never happened. It was all yeah. firsthand accounts. I witnessed something. This person was bad. And if they stayed in jail, it was all based on that. It was never based on the data. Now, the database helps us because we'll actually use it. But it's funny to have folks that, we're trying to train, and they're like, you realize this is all hocus pocus. Do you have any kind of stories along those lines? Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, um, let's see. I, one of my one of the countries in Africa that was a big stomping ground for me was Mali. Okay. Um, so, so their hocus pocus thing was, you know, the government's not real. You know, obviously they had a coup. Yeah. You know, so they know they would know better than I. <laughs> so we would um, we would actually go out there and do similar training with them. I was actually um, I actually went out there in support of uh, the New York National Guard. They were they were out there doing their thing, doing some um, psyop stuff. 19 Special Forces were out there doing some training with them. I went out there in kind of a force protection capacity. You know, you know, we all know what force protection means. That's yeah. you know, a lot of liaison, a lot of yeah. sipping tea and, and stuff <laughs> like that. You know, <laughs> that's the most nebulous of all the nebulous. We need you to do counterintelligence activities, Raj. I'm not going to ask gotcha. permission. I'm putting on my civilian clothes, and I will see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, so uh, very similar stuff. You know, you, you you show them their biometric stuff. You show them a seek, and they're like, no. <laughs> we're, we're probably not. At least they're honest that they're yeah. probably not going to use it. They they had no qualms about telling us that, you know, the Touregs were coming, the the northern Malian Touregs, they were going to come, yeah. and they were going to sweep through, and, you know, they were going to leave. That was it. You know, they, they weren't going to... Uh, they weren't going to defend. Uh, they didn't get paid enough money to do any of that kind of stuff. There's so, no like, trust in the organization. That commander's not. Yeah. That commander's going to be gone, and they're going with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I actually um, had a, a vehicle. So I was traveling back and forth from Severe in northern Mali down to Bamako. So on one of my trips back to Bamako, where the U.S. Embassy was at, um, you know, went back got into my hotel and you hear in a lot of blasts and a lot of gunfire and stuff felt like it was felt like it was Iraq again for a little bit. Yeah. And you know, I had my, had my little grip system set up, you know, I was, went up on the roof to do my little grip thing and you know, I'm looking down I'm seeing burning tires rolling down the street <laughs> yeah. and you know, I call up the embassy and they're like, hey, stay in your hotel. Um, a couple of our vehicles just got trashed. So the military was conducting a coup while at the same time, Severe had just gotten taken over like hours after I'd left it by the Malian Turex wow. who were working with the military in that coup. And I'm like, holy crap. And they were murdering people in that village, like right in the same area that we were at. So it was just like, super close call but you know what i did uh at that hotel no security whatsoever um police station about block and a half down the road i took a battle buddy from the national guard and we'd walk down to that police station with a box of mres huh a box of mres got us some front door protection yeah (laughs) some armed front door protection at that hotel it's funny because the simplest things will get you what you want uh one of my favorite stories to tell i I go back every year to my high school benicia high panthers rock we go back and i talk to him and one of the stories i always end up telling is you know we're in bosnia and we're trying to figure it out and we just really couldn't make any headway because because our job's hard it turns out it's really hard to get people to want to openly talk to you until they get to know you. And uh, what one of the things that broke us through into a, a new level of, of friends and networks was sunscreen. There's a box of sunscreen. Like, we're out here, we're doing all this construction on these houses, and the thing that we can't get that we would love to get, sunscreen. And I'm like, well, shit, I can how much do you need? No, like, you know, a tube would be great. And I'm like, how much do you really need? Like there's 35 of us or something like that was the number, like a small number of people. And the army, you know, the military is like, here's sunscreen. We have a whole giant shipping container full of sunscreen and we have to get rid of it because there's another shipping container coming, you know? So it was literally nothing. And the guy was so grateful. And I said, anytime you need stuff like that, let me know. I'll bring it to you, you know, anytime. And it's funny because the system hates that. The military system hates that. Like, we had this guy come in, comes in the gate, and he's doubled over, and he wants to give us some stuff. And I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? And we got these green counterintelligence people, and they just they don't know to know. 
And so I'm like, well, what's wrong with this guy? He's sweating, you know, and that's rare for a Rockies to be sweating like it's hot. Yeah. He's clearly in distress. Ask him what's going on. And so this is, dude, this is during an actual meet, right? Like, so there's professional business going on, audience, right? And so uh, my interpreter's like, oh, he he's wounded and he's having a lot of trouble with the wound and it's really sore and painful. And I'm like, let's get him to the hospital because this guy was really hurting. And they're like, oh, we're not allowed to do that. I'm like, I'll drive him over. I don't care. They can yell at me all they want. This is a human who's in distress and who's in front of us. You can't have a source meet. <laughs> It turns out this dude had been shot the week before. The wound was infected. And basically he was, you know, on his way to death. Would he have died? Who knows? Maybe he would have got some antibiotics. But he didn't have any antibiotics. And he had been shot. And these knuckleheads are trying to run a meet with this guy while he's literally, like, writhing in pain. Oh, and, God. And so I took him to the hospital. I'm like, you know, you guys got to at least give this guy a squirt of antibiotics. Give him a shot or something. And, you know, they yeah. did. They did. They're not supposed to, but here's a person delivered to your doorstep who is in tremendous physical pain. You, you, you give, you care for him. But again, the system, they hate that. They hate it. And so I use stuff like that all the time where I'm like, uh, I, I would bring on um, Iraqi elected officials onto the camp. And I would go up to the commander and say, hey, I'm going to be bringing these uh, VIPs on. I want to make sure that they have direct access. And they're like, yeah, whatever you want to do, Pete, because I'd built trust with that person. So then I would go to, like, to the person who runs the gate, you know, the sergeant of the guard. And I'm like, hey, listen, uh, these Iraqis are going to come in. You're not going to search them. You're going to treat them like VIPs. And I'm, I'm not nothing fancy, just, you know, sir, ma'am, like you normally would do. And they'd be like, nope, can't do it. And I'm like, the commander says we can do it. And so I'd have to go all the way back up and come all the way back down. And, and, you know, it's like these guys actually are elected to run this place that we're in. Like, they actually are VIPs. <laughs> we can't treat everybody like assholes. But the system hates it. They hated it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I want, this is one of the things that fascinates me. When we get our training to do our job, when you left, you, and you are, you're an adult at this point, you had already worked in the military, you knew a lot of the military stuff. Like, it wasn't like you were 100% green. It's a new job, but what did you really know how to do the day you left counterintelligence training? Man, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of everything, but yeah. a whole lot of nothing. Really. Yeah. I knew there was a lot of things that I needed to know. Yeah. You so know, what did you do? What's well, your journey? So um, I did everything. I did uh, I did a little bit of the MCC stuff, um, did uh, investigations. Uh, I mean, how did, did you learn how to be a good counterintelligence agent? I how put did, myself yeah. in a position every chance I got to be able to do my job. I networked with counterintelligence agents throughout my community, uh, throughout the Army, um, so I learned as much as I could. I went to every school that I could possibly sign up for. Um, and I just went out there and I got after it, you know, and you have to do that because there are CI kids out there. I call them kids because, you know, they're, I mean, probably two years into the army and they switch their MOSs, you know, yeah. uh, two to four years these days and they're switching their MOSs coming in, but they're, they're just so happy just to, be in the MOS, but they sit at a brigade for a, a, an infantry division and not do a damn thing. You're talking 5,000 like to 25,000 people in those size units, just for the audience's sake. It's a big organization. And it's easy to hide. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those guys become, oh, you want to be a counterintelligence agent. So how about we make you the passport agent? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they never get to see their job. You know, yeah. so so I was able to break out, break free of that kind of stuff, and you know, I was able to go to you know a great organization like USERAF, where you know it was brand new at the time. This was about 2009, 2010. It was brand new, so they needed everything between you know collections and investigations. I was the two X servicing right. all that stuff. I was the well, for all intents and purposes, I was the kicker for for Africa, 
you know, the, the Kika NCOIC, which is the counterintelligence coordinating authority. Yeah, he, he's saying a lot of words. What he basically said was he was in charge of the operations where humans talk to humans. And and that's a big thing. So I want to tell you my funny uh, my funny two uh, X story. I was in as a contractor. I was in Iraq and we were up in Mosul and it was dangerous. And Mosul had a two part camp where in the middle of the camp, the middle of of the of the cluster was a a rocky road that was a hundred percent red zone. So on one side of the street, military encampment, fairly safe to be on. And down the middle of it, a road, and then on the other side, an airfield. And so on a frequent occasion, we would have to cross from camp to camp. And as you know, as a counterintelligence person, I'm talking to everybody. And so I'm, I'm not just the guy that fixes the water truck. I'm the guy that talks to everybody. And so a new unit rolled in across the street, and they said all contractors must go through the contract gate. And this gate includes all of the Iraqi contractors as well. So if you're an Iraqi business owner, if you're an Iraqi driving a water truck or whatever it is, you're all in the same queue. And it might take you an hour, hour and a half to get through that line. And we're spies and we're held up in a line. (laughs) So we wouldn't do it. We'd drive through in the civilian car. Again, the system hates that. And so uh, I went up to our, our major contact. He was a major, not a major contact, just a major. And uh, like, hey, we need special access. We're not trying to be big shots here, but we talk to the worst people around and we can't be outside waiting for the next thing to happen. By the way, there was a suicide bomber on this camp that blew himself up while we were there, too. So it was a real threat. And he's like, yeah, well, that's the contractor gate and that's where everybody goes through. It's like, that's where the Iraqi contractors go through. They're like, yep, not going to happen. And I, well, you know, listen, here's what is going to happen. We work not for you, but for the theater asset, the the joint level. So the joint joint is really high for the audience's sake. And so, you know, long story getting long here, but uh, he didn't want to budge. And I begged him. I'm like, please make sure this happens. You you know, here's the backstory. The guy that was the 2X for theater was an Aussie, and he was ordered not to die. And he's like, I'm just going to try to make sure I don't die and do what my boss says and uh, make sure everybody has what they need, do my job like a pro, and occasionally get a little drunk. And so we had gotten drunk because, like you, I had networked into the, the, the two, you know, the spy world. And so I called him up, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, you know, I have this problem. And I explained it to him, and he's like, you guys can't be outside, not doing what you're doing. What? You know what? I need a field trip anyhow. And so... His level of authority is like, I need a helicopter going to Missoula and I want to go tomorrow. And then everybody goes, yes, sir. And so this major that stonewalled us and tried to big time us got a visit from a theater level asset. And he and his commander got told what was going to happen. And then the next day, the guy's like, why did you do that to me? And I'm like, dude, I begged you. I begged you not to make this dumb thing happen. And so then we fixed it. So, and yeah, that's a the bureaucracy. I I love it. Like, I could add an hour to this podcast by just talking about ICF in that way. Oh, my God. <laughs> ICF is the, is the things that we give people so that uh, others, so that we can get secrets. Sometimes you got to grease the skids. Sometimes you got to buy some cigarettes, some booze, some money. It's nothing about this is classified. You know, people will freak out by that. But none of that, every movie has it. It's no big deal. The regulation is maybe eight pages long and most of it is boilerplate and here's what it says do not steal the government's money that's what it says that's it people are terrified Terrified. to use the government's money (laughs) and i met the guy at theater in iraq who owned the connex that was full of cash and he's like anywhere you can help me get rid of this money there's so much money i want i need to use it and I'm like, dude, I'll, <laughs> I'll help you wherever I can. But you're right. If people who don't know what they're doing, who aren't even in the field, are like, no, 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 none of that money stuff. Like, this is why this is classified, because you don't need to know about it. You need to give me my bag of money. Let me go handle it. I'll write the reports. What, what am I going to do? Steal $2,000? Come on. Stop. Yeah. Stop. You my, know? my per diem for this trip, <laughs> you know, covers that. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, don't worry. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make... You know, anyhow, it, the whole thing is silly. So, okay, I want to understand this because there's a lot of self-development in this job. And when I was in, it was a little harder to go to schools because there was no real 
There was no real active threat going on at the time. So you try to rotate into some kind of deployment, but it was really hard. We did a lot of background investigations for clearances, so kind of a practical job as well. But there were a number of books that I read that enabled my, my mind to shift on how I approached the job. What would you say were a couple of the books that you read that taught you how to be a spy, whether they were relevant to spying or not? Oh, Traders Among Us was one of my favorites. Traders Among Us, oh, no. I am going to forget who that uh, author was, but it was basically the Clyde Conrad case. Okay. Back, uh, back in Cold War, uh, Army Intel Sergeant uh, was basically working with, who was it? It was the, it was the Turkish, but at, at first glance, it was the Russians, but it was actually the Turkish. It was, it was this really cool story on how, they, how these CIA agents kind of tracked him you know, cross continents, you know, back to the United States, back to Germany, and just to finally catch him. And after he'd sold, you know, hundreds and thousands of secrets uh, to these guys for, for pennies, you know, you know, I think he probably only made $120,000 uh, out of like 15 years of spying. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, but that was a really great story because it captured every element of counterintelligence just about, uh, you know, not so much the, the tactical version, of course, but, you know, we're talking about investigations and collections and liaison and all this really cool stuff that, you know, is really viable, especially if you're a strategic and or practical kind yeah. of guy. You know? Yeah. 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 The agent zigzag, that was pretty cool. Yeah. One of the things that benefited me was when I was in Bosnia, we were um, we did a lot of vulnerability assessments. We put together a package early, and everybody loved it. So we got bounced around from place to place. And so the byproduct of that was, as a young, and I had I had bosses above me, but they gave us a lot of room. And so I had to learn how to walk into someone's office who outranked me by at least four ranks almost every single time and then walk out with a positive outcome, you know, like, Hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's what I'm doing. You know, I'm an expert in this. And I didn't worry about my rank because my job was important. So I didn't mess around with the whole no rank thing. There's times for that for sure. But it wasn't like I come in with like, I'm a captain. Like, no, there was, it's just, I'm not trying to fool anybody. Like, here's what I'm doing. Here's, mm-hmm. here's, here's what the help I need, and then at the end, you'll have this product, and you asked for it. So, but, but learning how to do that, learning how to go around the camp and talk to everybody internally taught me so much about all of the miscommunication that happens on a camp where everybody's like, that's not my job. And all of a sudden, yeah. like, everybody's not doing what's not their job, which is appropriate, but these things are vital things that aren't being done, and it's harming the unit. And so I started studying us as much as I studied outside the other thing I did was I probably did 500 interviews in the time that oh, I was yeah. there all the time, cutting my teeth on questions, and I just became a master question asker. You know, I read books, of course, all the time, but I was lucky fairly early in my career to get a lot of field time where I was left alone to get it figured out because there is no school for that. There's, they can suggest yeah. it, but until you go out and, and do it, you know, it's just... You, you, it's good to have a mentor to guide you. I didn't. Yeah. I had bosses, but not really necessarily great mentors. But great in that they left me alone, and I'm the kind of guy that you can leave alone, and I will figure it out. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was mentored by the great and mighty CW4 Tony Domeyer. Nice. That guy. You might have met him out in Bosnia. I don't know, but he's he'd been around for about 28, 29 years wow. uh, before he finally retired. Uh, he was a um, 7th Special Forces group guy, eventually transitioned over to warrant officer. Uh, he was my, uh, he's my mentor for several years, and he actually wrote my, uh, my warrant officer recommendation letter when it was time for me to kind of take up the mantle, so to speak. Yeah, I, um, it's funny. Yeah, the, the, the names. I'll tell you, this is a funny story. So I, at, when I was at Fort Huachuca, I came back after my deployment, which is dumb because I had no business being there. That's not what the army normally sends you. They actually were going to send me to a unit that was coming right back to Bosnia. And I'm like, ah, I just left this place. I'd like to do something different. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever. It can suck, but don't send me back here because I've done this. Um, and so it just so happened that uh, I was getting married at the time and my wife who was in, she was curtailed to Wachuca. And so her orders 
superseded mine. And so I accidentally end up at Huachuca. And this is the uh, Center for Intelligence for the military, but primarily in the, the Army. So uh, I'm there, and one of my bosses from my, or actually a senior soldier from my last unit was there. And so she's like, I'm going to be running this division, and I'm going to bring you over because you're the perfect person to be there. You've literally just done this work. And I had no idea about this, but they're like, you on your team, you guys ran two operations. On the new regulation, no one else has done that. You're here. It's a dumb luck, and no one else is going to believe it because my low rank. But you actually are probably the most qualified person in the room in terms of, of teaching this stuff. So I, I taught source operations. And then fast forward, you know, 9-11 happens. It's 2004. I'm in Missoula, and there's a Marine team, a Marine C. I, there's a SEAL team there with a Marine chief who's a who's their intel guy. And he said, and I don't know anybody. And he's like, I know you. And I'm like, you don't know me. No, I don't know anybody. He's like, no, no, I, I know you. And I'm like, well, all right, let's play the game. Where have you been? You know, he's like, have, so have you been to Huachuca? I'm like, yeah, of course. I, I used to work there. Where did you work? I worked at the counterintelligence source operation course. He's like, that's where I know you're from. I was one of your students. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so he's like, here's what we're going to do. You guys are our guys. And and they loved us. They took care of us. They didn't stay very long, but we did a lot of stuff with them. And they also gave us their interpreter to watch over because there was going to be a gap in, in uh, teams that were going to be there. It was going to rotate to the uh, the SF guys. And so they're like, this is Johnny Walker. And Johnny Walker wrote a book. I'm in his book. But we got to do a lot of crazy stuff because I was an instructor at a school. And, and I... A marine counterintelligence guy happened to come through the course and happened to remember me. How crazy is that? <laughs> that is pretty crazy. Yeah, it's a small community, though. You know, we we definitely end up uh, bumping into each other um, at one point or another. You know, tell us. T- okay, so we're, we're about done here, but I want to know the time where you, you know, not necessarily scared, but the time where you're like, uh, I don't know what's going to happen here, but you know, we have to do this work, so. Well, let's go. Like the time when you took on a lot of risk or the time where the risk elevated outside of your control. Give us an idea of, of the danger of the job for a guy like us. Well, that uh, that uh, that coup in Mali was definitely up there. That was one yeah. of the big ones. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, my very first Africa mission was in Senegal. Not that that is a particularly dangerous area. Uh, but, you know, damn cities can be pretty scary on your own. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on out there. Um, went out there on my own, like kind of my first mission, <laughs> really yeah. my first TDY uh, by myself going out there. It was actually um, teaching uh, DocX, not Domex as a whole, but document exploitation. It was uh we were fielding a new system that uh, uh, AFRICOM out of Stuttgart, Germany, wanted to test out with the Senegalese uh, because, you know, the Ivory Coast was about to blow up uh, and they wanted to do some stuff over there uh, in Senegal before before that happened. And, and so just, um, you know, taking public transportation from your hotel to a Senegalese military base and that public transportation has no vetting whatsoever. Uh, and you're just kind of in that car with this strange person. You don't know where they're going to be taking you. That, you know, yes. that's typical kind of travel stuff. A lot of people do that. But, you know, when you're in a sketchy area that, you know, you know, when just a few <laughs> weeks ago, you know, a hotel yeah. was just, uh, you know, just raised, you know, a couple people came in and shot up a hotel. You know, that that's something that, you know, kind of, you know. Make your hair stand up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things, too, I try to explain to folks, because I'm, I'm open about it. I, you know, I'm a spy. I did spying. I would say the same basic thing when I was abroad, too. Like, I'm here to ask questions. If I ask a question that bothers you, tell me. Don't answer it. Whatever. I'm not trying to cause you any trouble or any, any harm or anything, you know. So just understand, yeah, I'm going to be asking questions. I'm trying to learn about you guys. And I work for the Army. Like, I was pretty open about the whole thing. Because when you show up and you ask a lot of questions and you don't belong there, guess what you are to everybody? <laughs> like you're not you're fooling anybody. If you're a, yeah. if you're a young kid and you're out backpacking around the hills of Iran, you know what you are. 
you're not a college kid hiking. You're a fucking spy. That's yep. what happens. So let's just start and let's get rid of the pretense and say, I'm here to ask questions. I don't want to yeah. cause anybody yeah. any trouble, you know? And yeah, just cut the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, man. Listen, let's uh, one more time so everybody can look it up if they want to contribute. If you're a, a service or veteran service member kind of person and you want to be part of the Tony Robbins thing or you want to get some advice on how to figure out the entrepreneurial path, give us that whole thing real fast and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a show. So, yeah, for the, for the Tony Robbins, so how do you want me to do it? Do you want me to tell you what, or talk about what we're doing with the Tony Robbins or just how we how to reach out to me? And Let's do that. Let's how to, how to get a hold of you, and then we'll go from there. So you can find me. You can find me on LinkedIn, and Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, J, Jason Madden. Um, my, my website is jmadden.esourcecoach.com. My email is jmadden at esourcecoach.com. Uh, you can shoot me a message. You can find me and shoot me a message off my website, off of any of my um, any of my social media sites. Just type in my name. You'll find me. Uh, pretty easy. I kind of communicate through all mediums these days. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, and seriously, take them up on it because here's the thing. Tony Robbins does incredible stuff. If you're not a Tony Robbins guy, look at the people in the room. Those people are all trying to get going in the same kind of direction, a positive direction. And so maybe you'll meet somebody there. And there's nothing wrong with Tony Robbins anyhow. You're going to love – he makes a lot of money because he's great at what he does. He'll motivate you. And these guys are looking to help. They're looking to try to get you – because here's, here's what happens ultimately. And, Jason, you know this. I get up to my knees. I help someone else get up to their knees. I get up. I, I'm, I'm kneeling. I'm standing. I even I'm bent over. I'm trying to help the person who's a little bit below me get up to the spot where I'm at and, and push up. And, and yeah, when you first transition, it's, it's dog eat dog for sure. But as we all get our breath and look around, we're like, how can I help someone? So as I'm getting help, I'm also looking to help. And, and we all owe that to each other. So absolutely don't, yeah, don't let these tickets sit. It's a $5,000 proposition for free yeah. and you're going to be in a room full of people you never could have imagined and the more often you can do that the better off you're going to be it'll enrich your life so take him up on it get some of his time he's willing to give it to you and talk to you about how to get your business going or just even sort out your crazy idea i'm going to put jason on the spot and make him say yes i will help you figure out your idea if it's crazy don't do it but if it's not let's figure out how to do it hey all all my services are free i do free coaching especially with veterans. I, I, I have most of my week allotted to working with veterans. Um, I don't charge you a dime. I, I have a pretty, pretty large intensive coaching uh, and education program geared specifically for you guys, for our brothers and sisters. All it takes is a little bit of your time, guys. 